His lecture this evening is titled Applying the Theological and Philosophical Work of Dr. Greg L. Bonson to the Subject of Work and Economics. Please give a warm welcome to David L. Bonson. So I gave a speech here for the first and only time about uh, the life of my father. And when I say first and only time, it was the first time since he passed. It was December 95 when Greg Bonson uh, passed away. And uh, let's see if it was 2017, which sounds right. That was the first time um, that I was addressing a topic near and dear to my heart. And I did it here in this very room. And when I walked in and, and saw the backdrop, I instantly uh, sort of remembered uh, that, that moment. It was a really difficult speech to give. I give a lot of speeches. I'm, I'm now giving, um, you know, over, over 50 a year, and I don't get emotional during speeches very often. Um, and yet that, of course, that topic, uh, you know, being uh, about my, my father was understandably emotional, but I'm talking about my dad tonight, and it's not um, particularly emotional, you know, in the sense that when I'm looking at something related to philosophy and theology, and in tonight's case, applying it to the field in which I work, which is economics, uh, it's very animating to me. It's something I care about pretty much more than anything in the world, but it is an emotional, where the personal component, uh, talking about dad, I did uh, from this very stage, and it was, it was something else. And so I've gotten a chance to watch the, the video of it, and I guess um, I just want to say to those who invited me to speak that I'm grateful for the opportunity because in a lot of ways it was a very um, therapeutic moment. And I hope those who heard it benefited from it. I stand by everything I said. I have people every now and then. It's sort of, I think, the curse of um, social media or, or the digital age and the courage people have behind a computer screen that will, will reach out to me to let me know what my dad really thought about something or... or <laughs> Or, or something, but, but look, um, I would like to think that for those who want to correct me over things he believed and, and spoke about and, and taught and were a part of his um, ministry platform, that, that most wouldn't think that they would want to correct me on those personal reflections, and so I, I felt like I had a certain degree of autonomy to be able to share that night, and I'm just very grateful for that opportunity. And, and I'm grateful for this sort of follow-up um, because I do believe that I'm asked to speak about economics and finance a lot. And, and more and more, I'm finding myself blessed to be able to do that in an audience that actually might be familiar with Greg Bonson a lot. When I'm speaking to a, a hedge fund um, audience in New York City, that's not a deeply philosophical crowd. And, and, and they, can be very, they can be brilliant people. And um, it, it's kind of like our fault, I think, um, as Christians, that there aren't more of them who are. So I'd need a few more years, and we'll get some more of that going. But what I, my point is, is that they're certainly not like familiar with the background, um, the context of Greg Bonson, per se. And yet there are certain um, avenues where I get to, and I, and I think people unintentionally make a mistake where they'll ask sometimes, your dad worked in the field of theology, philosophy, epistemology. He was in ministry. You chose to go into a career in Wall Street and finance. And why um, did you choose something so different for, for your life? And, and I think it's a fair question. For one thing, I will just tell you, for those of you who are fans of Greg Bonson, uh, that guy would, would be a lot happier with me on Wall Street than at a pastor in a... OPC Church. <laughs> just, I'm just promising you I'm not wrong about that. But I don't believe it's true that work in economics and work in applied finance, which is what pays my bills and is fundamental economic for anyone doing it well, I don't think it is very different from theology or philosophy other than that one is simply a foundational cornerstone on which the other is built is an application. And I want to talk a little bit about what that means tonight. Um, so I'm going to talk about Greg Bonson and economics, the pastor. Greg Bonson and economics, the theologian, philosopher. 
And then I'm going to talk about Greg Bonson and economics, the person. Um, you know, it was interesting. I got a chance to listen to a couple sermons that Dad had given in preparation for this talk tonight. And I will confess this, and this will be my last personal thing for a while. Uh, it's really, really hard for me uh, to listen to my dad's, my dad's stuff. I, I don't do it very often. First of all, he doesn't have anything I haven't listened to already. I promise you that. And a lot of it, of course, I heard in real time. I mean, I might have been seven, but I, I've heard it all. But I, heard, I listened to a lot of it after he died and, and re-listened to a lot of the stuff, both in, in philosophy and in covenant theology, which were topics of interest to me. Um, but, yeah, it, it is difficult sometimes to, to hear the voice because you can't, I don't know how many of you have lost someone that wasn't, you know, very senior in their age, because I think that would be different, but when, you, when someone dies at 47, I'm now 48, and so I'm hearing his voice now, and it was it's from something he may have said 30 years ago, but it still seems like it would be like right now, today. Like I, that's the only memory I have of the voice is the voice I'm hearing on the tape. And so then it pulls forward into, into the present sense for me and it, it kind of creeps me out a little bit. And yet, um, my gosh, some of this stuff is just so good. So good. And these weren't, you know, um, lectures. These were sermons on economics. And so there is a pastoral precedent where I don't have to tell you about kitchen table conversations. These are recorded sermons he gave. Um, it was in, uh, on economic ethics, but, but it was really amazing to me. And, and, and then, of course, throughout a very lengthy sermon series that he did in the book of Proverbs, any pastor trying to go through Proverbs without talking about wealth and economics is, is um, a liar. You can't preach Proverbs without talking economics. It would be a lie of omission, but that's still a a very sinful lie, and, and so Dad tackled that stuff quite heavily. But just pastorally, let me point out, he, he was unrelenting in his warnings about the idolatry of wealth, um, and, and, and as any good pastor should be, and, and anyone faithfully reading and reporting and preaching on the uh, scriptural teaching, he, he did not um, hesitate to point out the unambiguous message of scripture regarding um, idolatry that could often surround uh, one's um, obsession with, with accumulation of wealth. He also was equally, I think, unrelenting in a theology of God's sovereignty around the resources of the world. If you believe, as I do, that economics is the study of human action around the allocation of scarce resources, you've invited the um, creator of the world into your understanding very early. And the resources of the world and, and economics fundamentally having an awful lot to do with ownership and stewardship of resources, the debate around private property, for example, um, requires the theology of understanding God's ownership of the resources of the world. And, and Greg Bonson had a tremendous um, understanding of God's sovereignty around resources of the world and then an advocacy for private property that was rooted in a fundamental understanding of the world belonging to God, but under our stewardship by God's design. God tasking the stewardship of his property to us. And one of the sermons I listened to about this, he, dad was using, it was actually legal language, Jeff. He was talking about us as trustees, trustees of these assets that God, God had uh, put under our stewardship. Um, as was always the case, he believed that divorcing our view on an important study, discipline, or application from our faith commitments from the truth claims of the Christian worldview was an atrocity. And he publicly preached about the abhorrent idea of being neutral in the debate between socialism and free enterprise. So this is not unique to his treatment of economics. This is how he treated everything. But the myth of neutrality was a myth in economics, as it was in everything. And he would just smash antithesis all over your forehead if you attempted to approach economics neutrally any more than any other discipline. And then finally, and I was commenting um, in, in, in the green room with, with Chris and Jeff earlier, he was incredibly exegetical as a pastor. He preached on private property, okay? And this is, I think, the third 
sermon in a 10-part series he did on economic ethics. And he did a scripture reading every single Sunday. And so he'd go up, make a couple comments, and he'd do the scripture reading. And then that was, you know, the, the, the kind of formal intro into the sermon, right? It was the, the, the routine. But he did it as... Um, he went up and said, our scripture this morning is found in the 20th chapter of Exodus, verse 15, and he went and said, Exodus 20, 15, repeated it, thou shalt not steal. And he said, thus is the reading of the word of God. And he just read that. And then he went on to start the sermon. And so you could think, like, okay, he's being a little cutesy here. He's about to deliver what was a 51-minute sermon, which, by the way, is 51 more minutes than any preacher I've encountered is offered on the subject of economics, particularly <laughs> private property. Uh, in recent times. Um, and so you think, okay, he just says, thou shalt not steal. He's going on his lengthy sermon. But then in that sermon, he quoted 19 different scriptural passages. And I mean long ones. Parables, Old Testament, New Testament, the so-called problem passages. You guys know what a problem passage is? It's the word someone gives that has no conviction at all about anything in the scripture. The uh, verse sounds like it's a problem for what they believe, so they call it a problem passage instead of an exciting passage because you have to dig into it more and understand what it's really saying. So they're not problem passages. This is a pet peeve of mine. I know what people mean. I don't mean to be ungracious. But the whole thing. So then he's reading like 2 Kings. Who reads 2 Kings? How many, when, when was the last time any of you read 2 Kings? 2022? Anyone? Yes, this morning. Look at this. See, I can ask this question in a lot of evangelical churches and get a very different answer, but I forget where I am. <laughs> and in fairness, how many contemporary pastors have reach, recently preached from 2 Kings, I think we can, we can guess what the answer may be. So he was very exegetical, not just in the subject of private property, which is what this sermon was on, but in everything he did, he really preached, I think, faithfully from Scripture. But what I'm mostly here to talk about tonight is Greg Bonson, the theologian and philosopher as it pertains to economics. And, and I want to make clear that Dad did not first teach me the notion of economics as fundamentally the study of human action, but he may as well have. Because this notion, how many of you have heard that expression before, human action? And if you don't mind, I'm just curious, are familiar with the uh, Austrian economist Ludwig von Mises, who wrote the book Human Action? So de decent number of you. But there is a sense, I think very um, uh, democratically accepted now, uh, about the notion of human activity as the centerpiece of economics um, that, is, uh, exist, that exists, I think, today in a much broader way than it did in the early uh, 20th century. And when I first became uh, very obsessed with the study of Ludwig von Mises and the notion of human action and began studying deeper into this, there, there was this um, really blessed thing going on that I owed to dad because I was incapable of putting aside, dad wasn't an economist, and he wasn't an expert in economics, and he hadn't talked to me specifically about the nomenclature of human action. But what he had done was very early on in my life, and very persuasively taught me about the notion of approaching all understandings on the basis of first things and first principles. And he taught me when I was, throughout my schooling years, learning new things, new systems of thought to conduct an internal critique. Um, the, uh, the systems of thought that I would apply to my thinking on a given application, a given discipline. And so my study of economics was, from the very onset, um, informed by a presuppositional task, which was to conduct an internal critique of what I was studying and understanding. And I want to now go further back than Vamesis and human action in the early 20th century in our understanding of economics. And, and I think that most of us understand that um, Adam Smith is largely regarded as sort of the father of classical economics and in a lot of ways 
Smith didn't use this term. Karl Marx used this term to demean Smith, and all of us have taken on the term as if it's a term of endearment. And I just want to tactically, can I sidebar for a second? This is not in my notes at all. This is usually when I get in trouble, when I go off notes. There was a guy who was president once. That happened to a lot. He should... Um, I think that, where was I? I, I, I think that when we go back um, and, and, and evaluate all the times that we've surrendered a word or adopted a word uh, that uh, was not really necessarily meant as a term of endearment, we would find that we have really given our ideological opponents a lot of leeway. And there are very few terms, I think, have been more unhelpful to the cause of a free society than the term capitalist or capitalism. Now, of course, I know exactly what people mean when they say the word, and therefore, I frequently will confess to being a capitalist by that understanding. But that is not what the word means, just because of English. It's an ism around capital, and I, my ideology of free enterprise does not center merely around capital, though I view Capital is a very important instrumentation in the cause of human flourishing. But the ism is not about capital, and nor did Adam Smith say it, but I think Marx thought he was being cute. And certainly in the 20th century, it's been effective um, for progressives and for central planners to, to uh, demean the uh, concept of free enterprise by referring to it as an ism around capital. But nevertheless, back to the notes. I think there's extraordinary Christian theology, natural law, and moral philosophy in Adam Smith. Generally, the founder, considered uh, founder of classical economics, I think his contributions to the social science of economics are innumerable. But because of my dad's obsession with philosophical critique, I learned to sense the heavy influence of David Hume and other Enlightenment philosophers on Smith. Where many Christian bumper sticker readers are content with two sentences that were all taught about Adam Smith. One, he introduced the virtue of self-interest and free exchange in growing economic activity to the betterment of society. Fair enough. Adam Smith brought us this notion of self-interest when he famously said it's not, by, um, it's not a charitable endeavor for the, the baker and the brewer uh, to bring us our meal, but rather them acting out of their self-interest. And that, that dynamic can uh, essentially formulate uh, a growing economy and a, a, a better society. And then he did write, before the book Wealth of Nations, in uh, Theory of Moral Sentiments, that we must couple um, a theory of moral sentiments to our economic affairs. So these two things that most people know about Adam Smith, a general laissez-faire uh, orientation to economics, fair enough. A general appreciation for moral formation, also fair enough. These things are true. Smith was right. They are and were profound. They're accurate teachings of the great Adam Smith. But Smith was a disciple of David Hume. Not in his religious skepticism, per se, but in the empiricism category, nonetheless. He believed in economic observation out of a sort of enlightenment rationalism that would ultimately leave holes in classical economics. It was an incomplete anthropology, and its theory of value was one that Marx would have a field day with. Fast forward a bit, and Ludwig von Mises introduces us to the praxeology to economics, that is, a logic of human action. To read some of the great early 20th century economists, one frequently feels like they're reading Cornelius Van Til, not only because of their European nativity brought to American writing, which is just a subject all of its own, but there exists in the writing of influential economists like von Mies and Hayek, a real focus on one's theory of knowledge a commitment to a priori logic in economics. Propositions are arrived via contemplation and intellectual commitments, not merely empirical research or observation. The entire neoclassical school, neo-Keynesian school, progressive school, disputes this. They believe they can math and science their way to central planning. The Austrian school said no, and they said it presuppositionally. 
So much of great Austrian economic thought comes because this realization comes because of this realization that economic principles existed before there had been economic phenomena to study. Okay? Supply and demand is not true because we studied it. It was true before we studied it. And I can go on and on. But this a priori nature of Austrianism had a certain presuppositional uh, bend, if you will. We cannot make sense of economics without presuppositions around the intentions, purposes, nature, Jeff spoke about this earlier, means and needs of man, of the human person. The secular Austrians had this right. They got a priori logic in economics before a single Christian ever did, at least who was published in a systematic sense about economics. But they could never complete the full circle because they lacked the understanding of the human person revealed to us in Holy Scripture. They advocated for the right methodology, but without the fully anchored presuppositions. So in a contemporary formation of economic understanding that learns from the great classical economists like Adam Smith, David Ricardo, Jean-Baptiste Say, about mutual cooperation, free exchange, division of labor, and other world-changing dynamics, we find great value, but not the foundational answers to the underlying questions of why and how. And in the advances in the late 19th century, because really Karl Menger predated Ludwig von Mies in the Austrian school, the late 19th into the 20th century, around subjective theory of value, economic calculation, other valuable Austrian contributions, we still come up short if our real objective is a biblical foundation. But see, Greg Bonson wouldn't have that. And I believe the need of the hour has been to build that distinctly Christian understanding of economics that can better house classical truths and Austrian theories. And, and I can include various aspects of monetarist thought and supply side policy formation, but that can better house these things because we provide the anthropology, the worldview, the presuppositions, the theory of the case. And in fact, we can make better sense of them for the purpose of better application and living. This burden, this call, is a distinct aspect of the theology and philosophy of Greg Bonson. The biblical foundations, I think, are missing in many of my almost fully economic friends. Like They're almost what I want them to be, but are missing these, these foundational components of which I speak. These biblical foundations start in the book of Genesis. And as Jeff will always do when he speaks about law and policy, and I will always do when I speak about economics and finances, I will begin at the beginning, at creation, where we do begin the study of economics. And it requires us to take seriously, a study of Genesis 1 requires us to take seriously the notion of anthropology as the first subject in economics. Anthropology being, of course, the study of the human person. The major pillars in a Christian economic worldview, which I consider to be a production-first focus, the distinctly Christian view of economics, contrary to today's Keynesian thinking that is rooted in consumption, that we practice the notion that we must stimulate people to spend more as a means of driving economic activity. Um, I think that my critique of the consumption orientation of economics and my uh, lifelong obsession with the purpose and calling of being producers starts in Genesis with a theological teaching that mankind pre-fall Pre-fall, mankind was made with a purpose and a nature that was individual, yet social, with an eternal destiny, and teleological, with purpose. I'm going to sidebar again from the notes, but this time say nothing funny or interesting for that matter. <laughs> the critique of John Maynard Keynes or any particular economist in the White House or on TV, or at the Fed, or a writer in the New York Times, or somebody that we all like to beat up on and do the own the libs thing and stuff that Jeff was criticizing earlier. Jeff was way, way too nice about all that stuff, by the way. 
um, the consumption-oriented view of economics that is ruling our society is not foundationally bad because it's unaffordable. It is unaffordable and it is bad. It's foundationally bad because it misunderstands what God created us for. It misunderstands the human person. When you appreciate the full orb scriptural teaching of mankind as being an individual, that your life individually has meaning apart from a collective you belong to, and that just as our triune God is one God in three persons, that you are an individual meaning and are part of a broader community in a society, in a family, in a church, that there is both an individual dignity and a social expectation, a social reality, cooperation, organization, that you do have an eternal destiny and that what we are talking about in Genesis is purposeful. That in Genesis 1:26 through 28, God was telling mankind what he made us for. And he was giving us the raw material of the earth that he created ex nihilo and asking us to go co-create with him. And the only caveat is that we can't do it ex nihilo. He did it out of nothing. Now we get to do it out of the things he made for us. But he made the world with potential. And we're supposed to make the world into actual. And this was the mandate God gave us in the garden pre-fall. But there's more. Only the Christian worldview allows us to see mankind as being unique as an image bearer of God. What is the point of talking about human action if at a deeper level the activity of a giraffe and a human is theoretically equal other than maybe transactional, other than how, perhaps how one can go about extracting utility as if a person can just be a, an object of someone else's need. They are the subject of economics, the human person, you and me. The subject of economics, not the object, because God made us. Why is that true? Because God made us as an image bearer of him, possessing a dignity that the rest of creation does not have. I ask the uh, upperclassmen at the high school in Newport Beach um, that I started, I teach economics two mornings a week there, and I ask them, how many of you love your pets? And I'm going to ask you guys right now, how many of you have pets and you really love them? Your cats or dogs or whatever it is. Okay, fair amount. All right, I have a dog. I don't love it at all. But here's the thing. I'm just kidding. I say a lot of things when my wife's not here. I wouldn't say if she was here. Um, none of us have pets that possess the dignity that we do because God didn't make those pets with that dignity. And one of the illustrations that I become very fond of in better understanding, signifying, illustrating this enlightened dignity that mankind has via creation is that we can see and appreciate beauty and we can create beauty. And I don't believe God made anything else that can do that but us. I think it's beautiful. And then God himself said, and Jeff went through some of this uh, sequence in a different context in his talk, but God just went day by day of everything he's making. It is good, it is good. The, the light, the sun, the moon, the stars, the vegetation, the fish, the waters, the land. But then he gets to us and he says it's very good. We're the only part of creation that got the modifier. And that was a byproduct of the special status that God provided to the human people who are at the center of our subject of economics. So he tasked us pre-fall and post-fall with growth. Now that's an economic message. It's not a devotion. It's not a traditional Sunday morning sermon, but maybe it ought to be. Because he tasked us with growth, with cultivation, with stewardship, with calling with purpose. We now have journals of books on human action, yet it's the theology and philosophy promoted by people like Greg Bonson that taught me that I have to understand what it is to be human and understand why we act if I am to understand human action. We act out of a created order 
and in a universe held together by a God who possesses an immutable character. Our devotion to economics is a devotion to the human person, individual and in community, because God is interested in the human person and God is interested in societies of human persons. Societies that must coordinate their activities to one another. The principles that I'm committed to as an economist flow from a theology and philosophy that can very, very distinctly be called Bonsinian. Only I mean the smart one, Greg, not his middle son, David. His love of Calvin and Kuiper and Van Til all inform, all speak to the need to find truth out of God's truth. This must be the burden of the next decade of economic study. And it alone will defeat the progressive horrors of Bernie Sanders and AOC and university professors and high school teachers. I can keep going. <laughs> All that you think is wrong out there in economic teaching, economic understanding. Usually it's as simple as a basic policy mistake. They tax too much or they regulate too much or they spend too much. Generally, those are more critiques of the size of government, which really is a critique of the lack of poor self-government. But I don't think people necessarily think through that whole syllogism. My point is, whatever your view is of what you want a positive affirmation of economics to be or a critique of present economics, the only thing I can say is that we are not going to win with the socialist forces that have so much influence in institutions without getting this foundational understanding right. We largely, and a lot of evangelicals did this too. I think they were being somewhat utilitarian, but evangelicals outsourced defense of free enterprise to Ayn Rand. That was a big mistake. I want to say one more thing. It is not, I actually want to say a lot more things. I'm going to say one thing right now. There's a new trend in the right, playing footsies with big governmentism and opposition to market orthodoxy, opposition to the notion of a free enterprise system. It's not just Bernie and AOC, but even this new movement taking hold that will require a thoughtful, civil, intellectual, scriptural, theological foundation rooted in great economic truth to fight back. I join millions of members of the Christian community. I'm not alone on this one. Millions of people in the cause of a free and virtuous society. But I do so with the theological and philosophical commitments that I'm certain Greg Bonson stood for. And so when we move past Greg Bonson theologian, philosopher in economics, I do want to close with another personal comment, but I'm quite sure I can get through this one uh, without the emotion of five years ago. First of all, this is anecdotal, and I debated if I wanted to bring it up, but I just do. Uh, this is a highly ecumenical issue. There's a lot of issues in Christian theology that require very specific distinctives in defending and promoting a certain theological point of view. There's a divide amongst many in different Christian traditions. I don't understand for the life of me why we A, have to be nasty about it, and B, have to pretend like we don't have those divisions. We can debate them, discuss them. We need to. But this is an area much like law, much like legal thought, philosophy. This is an ecumenical need in the culture. And I just was intrigued by the fact that I heard seven quotes of my dad in two sermons from the great Catholic scholar Michael Novak, who passed away a number of years ago um, and is a writer of some of the great masterpieces in defending the cause of a free and virtuous society. That's just anecdotal. But there are shared creational beliefs that are vital to this cause of anthropology at the root of economic worldview. But I do want to get into a practical aspect of Greg Bonson, the person in economics. And, and I want to start with what his theology of wealth was not. It was not that wealth accumulation was good to the extent you could give to him 
or his ministry or the church he pastored or a building fund he was connected to. Now, you don't have to worry about the building fund thing because he really wasn't big on building funds. He wasn't big on ministry projects that were more vanity-oriented than programmatic. He was sort of a programmatic kind of guy. But my point is, I never saw him solicit a donor for money. And I don't think there's anything wrong with solicitation of a donor. That's not my point. But I do think something has become systemic in Christian churches um, that I want to speak against and use my dad's life as a testimonial. I believe it's become absolutely common, almost predictable, that there will be preaching about the dangers of wealth. There will very rarely, outside of certain charismatic churches, be sermons on the merit, virtue, and beauty of wealth, or more particularly, what wealth actually is. Because as soon as we say wealth, you think I'm talking about money, and I'm not. Wealth is goods and services that accumulate for the meeting of the needs of humanity, increasing quality of life for humanity. So the production of goods and services is the sum total of wealth. And of course, we have ways we can quantify that through capital accumulation, profit motive, things like that. But my point is that we don't have enough sermons on the beauty of wealth accumulation, but we do have the systemic habit of preaching on the dangers of wealth but then suggesting that the right lifestyle for Christians to live is somewhere right around the middle class or often upper middle class lifestyle that the pastor themselves lives at. And then, step three, to ask that person for a big check. Pastorally, my dad, did, he did not covet. Yeah, he, made, he had sins in his life like all of us. He had areas of, of struggle, you know. Covetousness wasn't one of them. He, was, he just struck me as someone who admired successful people without viewing them as a mark. The transactional relationship between today's ordained and the converted wealthy is grotesque. And it is a common aspect in the contemporary church. Forgive me for painting with too broad of a brush. I know there are exceptions, but I'm speaking in a general sense on purpose. I hope you'll for, forgive me. You wouldn't have seen a whiff of that from Greg Bonson. He simply wasn't conflicted over biblical teaching on wealth. He didn't aspire to have his ministry's identity associated with a vanity project. He wasn't covetous of people who had more money than him, which was most people. He liked nice things, but he knew what path he had signed up for economically in life. I think that's an important distinction on the pastoral side. But then I'll close with this for all of us, all of us in the room not ordained. I mentioned earlier my obsession with production-centric economics, my belief that God, who is a worker, who worked to create the world in six days, who is a creator, an innovator, that God was a producer, made us in his image, therefore made us to be workers, producers, creators, and innovators. Ray Bonson's vocational field, and I don't, much like Jeff talked about earlier, don't do the dualism thing. I don't believe in a sacred-secular distinction. And what my dad wanted to do with antithesis, I want to do to sacred secular distinction, which is much connected to the same topic. I want to blow it up. Dad's chosen vocational field was that of a philosopher and theologian, a pastor, a teacher. Um, but I'm telling you, he was the hardest working person I ever saw in my life. There was no self-righteous piety about, well, you know, I'm not one who has to work all the time, and I'm able to, to I have this real, that today this, this treasure on your free time, and your, what do they call it, self-care, and other things that I just, <laughs> they're laughable concepts, but they were not the way I was raised, and I'm, and I'm grateful for that, I am. Um, if one really wants to understand, the philosophy and theology of Greg Bonson's economics, then please look no further than how he lived. He modeled the diligence that is at the heart of free enterprise, and there is nothing more theological and philosophical than that. Thank you very much.